Greetings and welcome to Voices. Voices, short for Voices of a People's History of the United States, is a new video series largely based on the book A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn and sponsored by the Sylvania Multicultural Center. We, the staff and students of the Sylvania Multicultural Center, are using this series as a platform to uplift the voices of those Americans, past and present, who have dissented and or rebelled against the social injustices prevalent in their day in an effort to challenge this nation to live up to the ideals and values upon which it was founded. Our first video of the series features Dr. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz and a passage from her distinguished book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States. We are honored to have Rachel Black Elk, Program Assistant for the Southeast Multicultural Center, perform this excerpt of Dr. Dunbar Ortiz's work. I am your narrator, Dr. Clifford C. Meeks, Assistant Coordinator for the Sylvania Multicultural Center. We hope you enjoy our presentation. Noted writer, historian, and activist, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz grew up in impoverished rural Oklahoma during the 1940s and 50s as the daughter of a tenant farmer and a part Native American mother. She studied at San Francisco State College and eventually earned a PhD in history from the University of California, Los Angeles. After receiving her PhD, Dr. Dunbar Ortiz taught in the newly established Native American Studies Program at California State University Hayward Campus and helped found the Department of Ethnic Studies and Women's Studies. She is currently Professor Emerita of Ethnic Studies at California State University East Bay Campus. Dr. Dunbar Ortiz is renowned for her lifelong commitment to national and international social justice issues. For more than four decades, she has been actively working with indigenous communities for sovereignty and land rights and helping to build an international indigenous movement. Professor Dunbar Ortiz is the author of numerous books and articles on indigenous people's right to self-determination, including Roots of Resistance, A History of Land Tenure in New Mexico, The Great Sioux Nation, and All the Real Indians Died Off, and 20 Other Myths About Native Americans. In her most notable work, An Indigenous People's History of the United States, which received the 2015 American Book Award, Dr. Dunbar Ortiz challenges the founding myth of the United States and shows how policy against the indigenous peoples was colonialist and designed to seize the territories of the original inhabitants, displacing or eliminating them. In this excerpt, she describes the characteristics of settler colonialism and its impact on indigenous peoples as a manifestation of American genocidal policy. And now I present Rachel Black Elk as Dr. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz reading an excerpt from an indigenous people's history of the United States. Settler colonialism as an institution or system requires violence or the threat of violence to attain its goals. People do not hand over their land, resources, children, and futures without a fight, and that fight is met with violence. 
and employing the force necessary to accomplish its expansionist goals, a colonizing regime institutionalizes violence. The notion that settler colonialism conflicts as an inevitable product of cultural differences and misunderstandings, or that violence was committed equally by the colonized and the colonizer, blurs the nature of the historical processes. Euro-American colonialism, an aspect of the capitalist economic globalization, had from its beginnings a genocidal tendency. The term genocide was coined through the Shoah or Holocaust and its prohibition has enshrined in the United Nations Convention adopted in 1948. The UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. The convention is not retroactive but is applicable to U.S. Indigenous relations since 1988 when the U.S. Senate ratified it. The terms of the Genocide Convention are also useful tools for historical analysis of the effects of colonialism in any era. In the convention, any one of five acts is considered genocide if committed with intent to destroy a whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group, killing members of the group causing serious bodily harm or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group, in the 1990s, the term ethnic cleansing became a useful descriptive term for genocide. U.S. history, as well as inherited indigenous trauma, cannot be understood without dealing with the genocide of the United States committed against indigenous people. From the colonial period through the founding of the United States and the continuing in the 20th century, this has entailed torture terror, sexual abuse, massacres, systemic military occupations, removal of indigenous people from their ancestral territories, and removals of indigenous children to military-like boarding schools. The absence of even the slightest note of regret or tragedy in the annual celebration of the U.S. independence betrays a deep disconnect in the consciousness of U.S. Americans. Settler colonialism is inherently genocidal in terms of genocide, in terms of the genocide convention. In the case of the British North American colonies and the United States, not only extermination and removal were practiced, but also the disappearing of the prior existence of indigenous people. And this continues to be perpetuated in local histories. Anishinaabe Ojibwe historian Jean O'Brien names this practice of writing in Indians out of existence firsting and lasting. All over the continent, local histories, monuments, and signage narrate the history of first settlement, the founders, the first school, the first dwelling, first everything, as if there have never been occupants who thrived in these places before Euro-Americans. On the other hand, the national narrative tells of lasts, last Indians, last tribes, such as the last of the Mohicans, Ishi, the last Indian, an end of the trail as a famous sculpture by, Germ by James Earl Frazier is titled. Documented policies of genocide on the part of the US administrations can be identified in at least four distinct periods. The Jacksonian era of forced removal, the California gold rush in Northern California, the post-Civil War era, and the so-called Indian Wars in the Great Plains, and the 1950s termination period, all of which are discussed in the following chapters. Cases of genocide carried out as policy may be found in historical documents, as well as in oral histories of indigenous communities. <laughs>
An example from 1873 is typical with General William T. Sherman writing, we must act with vindictive earnest against the Sioux, even to their extermination, men, women, and children. During an assault, the soldiers cannot pause to distinguish between male and female or even discriminate as to age. As Patrick Wolfe has noted, the peculiarity of settler colonialism is that the goal is elimination of indigenous populations in order to make land available to settlers. This project is not limited to government policy, but rather involves all kinds of agencies, voluntary militias, and the settler themselves acting on their own. In the act of in the wake of the U.S. 1950s termination and relocation policies, a pan-Indigenous movement arose in tandem with the powerful African-American civil rights movement and the broad-based social justice and anti-war movements of the 1960s. The Indigenous rights movement succeeded in reversing the U.S. termination policy. However, Repression, armed attacks, and legislative attempts to undo treaty rights began again in the late 1970s, giving rise to the international indigenous movement, which greatly broadened the support for indigenous sovereignty and territorial rights in the United States. The early 21st century has seen increased exploitation of energy resources begetting new pressures on indigenous lands. Exploitation by the largest corporations, often in, coll in collusion with the politicians at local, state, and federal levels, and even within some indigenous governments, can spell a final demise for indigenous land bases and resources. Strengthening indigenous sovereignty and self-determination to prevent that will result in great to prevent that will take general outrage and demand, which in turn will require that general population who's descended from settlers and immigrants know their history and assume responsibility. Resistance to these powerful corporate forces continues to have profound implications for US socioeconomic and political development in the future. <laughs>